There was no talk about seed oils until I started the conversation. Seed oils are of the devil. Seed oils are some of the worst things your body can consume. So my book came out in 2009. Nobody was talking about it. What can you tell us about the diet that you were actually doing with the Lakers as, as the nutrition director? To get the seed oils out of their diet every single place that the Lakers fed them. Do you think there is any argument to be made that some people could do better on a plant-based or vegan diet? They have adapted, they do adapt. We all would adapt, but the way that we adapt is by... What do you do when you see a problem that all of your colleagues are in denial of, when to speak of it could lead to ridicule from some of the people that you admire most. Do you keep quiet and follow the status quo? Or do you speak up for what you know is the truth? Dr. Kate Shanahan has been blowing the whistle on seed oils for over a decade now, which sadly seemed to have gained a pass by being placed in the same positive category as olive oil. But these seed oils may not be what they seem rancid oils that people claim are responsible for obesity, insulin resistance, premature aging, and disease after disease after disease. As an MD and multiple time best-selling author, today Dr. Kate and I will be covering not just seed oils and their health implications, but we will also be asking if there is a perfect diet, possible pros and cons to the vegan diet, and the absolutely crazy link between your grandparents and your parents diet and how it can impact your body, your beauty, your fertility, and so much more in shocking ways. Now, although her main focus is on fat loss and optimizing health, we will also be covering how she was able to apply these principles to some of the best athletes in the entire world, like the Lakers during the era of Jeremy Lin and Kobe Bryant. If this is your first time here, I make bi-weekly deep dives into fitness, nutrition, and wellness pop culture trends, as well as holistic bodybuilding and powerlifting content, so make sure to subscribe to hear some more of that. Put a comment on whether or not you personally choose to avoid seed oils. So with all that out of the way, guys, my name is Andrew with Holistic Motion. Let's get into it with Dr. Kate Shanahan. Hey guys, this is Andrew with Holistic Motion. We've got Dr. Kate Shanahan on today, uh, an author that I've actually been following for a, a while now, heard you on a ton of podcasts. Um, quick, quick, funny story for you, actually. Uh, I first heard you on Ben Greenfield's podcast probably like seven or eight years ago and uh, wrote your name down wrong in my notes app. So I, I didn't have your name down properly. And I tried looking your book up, couldn't find it. And then I ended up doing this holistic health coaching program through Paul Check. And I'm talking to someone and they go, oh, you have to check out Kate Shanahan's book, Deep Nutrition. And I'm like, that's what it was. That's what the book is called. And like, I, you know, then I ended up reading it and loving it. But I, I have a rule about reading people's books where if I hear about it once, I write it down. If I hear about it twice, I have to read a summary. If I hear about it a third time, I have to read it. And that weekend at that course, I heard about your book like five times. So <laughs> you've made a huge noticeable impact. Um, but yeah, please uh, tell us about you. I've already done the intro, but yeah, give us give us your, your elevator pitch for yourself. So I'm a family physician and I went to medical school hoping to get to the root cause of, of medical conditions, including my own at the time. I had lots of sports injuries, but doctors don't learn this. So I left medical school They're a little bit disappointed. Um, you know, doctors do learn a lot about uh, categorizing diseases and diagnosing them and what drugs to give. But our nutrition knowledge is not only limited, it's actually dangerous. And of course, I had no idea of any of this until I got even sicker myself. And I then stumbled into what was uh, the root cause of not just my own medical problems, but actually my patients and increasingly now around the world, because a big part of what was harming my health <clears throat> was the fact that I was eating these a, a collection of eight vegetable oils that I call the hateful eight. And these oils promote oxidative stress. But I didn't know that from going to medical school. And I certainly didn't know that was the problem when I got sick. And in fact, I had to figure it all out myself. Like I, it was, I was living on the island of Kauai. This was 2002. Google wasn't even a thing that I was aware of. And the only reason I stumbled into it was because the 
concept of essential fatty acids was mentioned in this book by a 1990s health guru named Dr. Andrew Weil. So when I uh, read the book by this guru, Andrew Weil, um, I came into the term essential fatty acids, which I hadn't learned about in medical school because uh, this was, I went to medical school in the 1990s and it just wasn't part of the education yet. And so it was fascinating. And I thought maybe, gosh, that would help me get better because I had a serious medical problem. I wasn't able to like barely able to walk and um, nobody could tell me what was wrong. So the only really option left was try to eat better and try to learn what a better diet looks like, which is a big task, uh, but, you know, in the days before Google. So I started with biochemistry and what are these essential fatty acids? And I, I uh, long story short, I learned that uh, the vegetable oils in my diet were probably doing way more harm than I had realized or that even medical science could possibly conceive of. So um, that became a huge journey into, well, gosh, what should people really eat? And that became the book, Deep Nutrition. Um, and I couldn't have done it if I weren't living on the island of Hawaii, Kauai, Hawaii, probably specifically, because that island did not even have electricity till the 1970s. And people there had grown up living almost like a completely ancestral lifestyle, completely um, like almost indigenous, you know, because they had to grow and make and catch and hunt their own food for the most part. There really wasn't, you know, what's the point of a grocery store with, with you know, you don't need to shop for food when you have it growing in your backyard. So that was another reason why there just wasn't a huge need even for electricity on the island. So, um, so it was a different world and it gave me this window into the, the human past and what, people used to nourish themselves with. And also, not just what they ate, but how it affected their health. Because my patients who had grown up that way were like a distinct um, like race almost of, species, of human. They, they were so much healthier. They didn't have these problems. They didn't have diabetes or obesity. Or if they did, it wasn't really slowing them down, right? Because they were still, uh, some of them even then were eating the vegetable oils. But they were so healthy in their 60s and 70s. They didn't have cancer. They felt that, like they were so energetic. You could just tell they were bursting with energy. And um, so I was fascinated by, by that. And then I got fascinated with what they ate, which was drastically different than anything I'd ever eaten. <laughs> it was including like they raised goats and they caught fish and they used they fermented fish under the sink and they would, you know, boil goat legs in giant pots and they would You'd go be walking through the woods and you would hear like them, oh, I guess they're slaughtering their pigs and collecting the mm. blood because it went Nose on forever. Nose to tail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, they, it was really, you, you know, fascinating. And I, then I went from there. I was like, well, gosh, what else do people eat around the world? And so that went into Becoming Deep Nutrition where I had dis discovered that there were such common elements to everyone's diet that I thought that was extremely important and uh, that we needed to know about that because we needed to do it ourselves uh, if we want to be healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that really shocked me when I was going through your book was the, just the connection that you showed between like diet of, you know, your, your parents, your mother, your grandmother, and how it actually impacts like the symmetry of your body, the shape of your face, all these different things, which, you know, uh, when you very first hear it, it's like, okay, of course, nutrition of your parents is going to impact those things, but also just how direct it is and how long it tends to take to correct it, so to speak. So I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Pottinger's cats. Yeah. Cause you like Weston, Weston A. Price. Uh, I was, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, the way that you're the diets of your grandmother and your mother actually impact like traditional beauty standards. Yeah. So this uh, comes from a field of genetics called epigenetics. It's a sub branch of genetics. That's actually far more complex than genetics because it has to do with how our genes are actually regulated, like what turns them on and off in any given cell, which is a fundamentally important process in our development, in our growth, and in the speciation of animals, you know, in evolution itself. And so 
the way that our nutrition regulates our genes is by directly, in some cases, binding to our DNA. So like methyl groups from B vitamins will methylate DNA. So if you've heard of getting your methylation test, um, this is an epigenetic thing. And the presence or absence of various nutrients in the diet, along with other factors like stress and whether you've slept and you know, a, a num numerous other things, um, exercise being a big one, all of that changes the expression of your DNA, which changes how you grow, it mediates how you grow. So you might have the exact same DNA as like if you have an identical twin, for example, but um, in, in your lifetime, so you would have identif identical epigenetic, you come into the world with I identical epigenetic like tagging on your DNA, mm -hmm. but then it, you could change it so that your children versus your twins children have a different like way of developing and way of growing. And, and that comes from your diet. So like, let's say one twin doesn't ever eat dairy. So they're probably going to be calcium deficient. And in you know today's world, we mostly get our calcium from dairy. So they might have osteoporosis and this might tag their own DNA. Like if they're having this calcium deficient diet before they conceive children, that would tag their own DNA in a way that might change their growth, for example, by making them prone to osteoporosis or making them shorter or making their bones thinner. So they don't grow shorter, but their bones are weaker. These are adaptations to a suboptimal diet that can impair our growth. And of course, the other side of that is if your diet has been fantastic and perfect, mm -hmm. then your growth is optimal. And it turns out that we are like all born with an ability to detect optimal growth because we are physically attracted to it. This is something that's so important that nature doesn't take chances. We can't help it. It's hormonal. <laughs> if we see an attractive member of the same sex or the op opposite sex, we react to them differently than if they are less optimally developed. And this is, this is not like a cultural beauty standard, which, and a lot of people, when you start talking about beauty, you talk about, oh, well, it's cultural. You know, everyone is different. I mean, that's somewhat true. Like our fashions are different, but when it comes to skeletal development and facial structure, we recognize optimal in every human race. And we recognize it in animals. Like we're much more honest about it when it comes to horse trading, right? Like we want a, a horse with straight teeth. That's an interesting <laughs> example. I hadn't considered that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's so, really interesting. Sorry, continue. Well, I mean, farmers rely on this, right? That's how they decide who's a good breeding bull is by what the bull looks like. They don't necessarily do genetic tests. They also look at his like, like lineage and, you know, his own breeding, but that's all going to be reflected also in, you know, for, for good, for bulls, uh, you want to be able to have cows with wide hips, right? So, and you want to have, when it's, we're talking about horses, they always look at their teeth as uh, he wants straight teeth. Well, it turns out the same applies to people who have been well fed for generations. And I mean, you could say, you know, it sounds almost like like bad to say, well, breeding stock, like humans have breeding like that. People get really scared about eugenics whenever you talk about I, I this know. stuff. I know. It's like, why are we so like unwilling to, to and childish almost to to say, oh, well, that none of that applies to us. That's what, that's what the issue, you know, that's what they're saying is like, well, it applies to all other animals, but we're better than that. And yeah. I see it as a kind of arrogance, really, honestly. I mean, I know it's also, there's been in, in history, it's, well, thanks really to just like really one person um, <laughs> yep. who we're not allowed to say anymore yep. Um, yep. on most platforms. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so thanks to that, like it's become uh, taboo, but it's an important part of health. And, and it, it was a part of medicine before World War II, actually. 
doctors talked openly about how you want to have a baby with, you know, like a good big jaw. So, so that the, that baby would grow up to be healthy. It was known. It wasn't like controversial and until it became politically incorrect. Yeah. And, and that's really done a detriment to our understanding of human health and our understanding of medicine and, a, and particularly our understanding of nutrition, you know, just to say that it's, oh, it's all down to, you know, prejudice, right? Well, yeah. the prejudice exists. There's nothing we can do about that. We are yeah. prejudiced against people who aren't look as unhealthy. attractive. I mean, just look at yeah. anybody on social media, <laughs> right? Yep. And, uh, you know, I mean, even the people who are overweight, they still have a, amazing facial structure. And our prejudices are quite obvious in, in terms of height for men, right? Males who are shorter, I think it's something like an average of $30,000 less per year per inch yeah, of height. It's and, like and, a crazy amount of money, which I and mean, that was a, I mean, shout out to my mom and dad. Right? Cause for whatever reason, I'm tall. I'm like the tallest person in my family, but somebody <laughs> ate well. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe you. Uh, so in, uh, in the case of Jeremy Lin, you know, I was working for the Lakers for six years and Jeremy Lin was a Laker for one of those years. So Jeremy Lin is, um, if you don't remember him, he was like the, the era of Lin sanity. He's, he's Chinese heritage, but he was, you know, one of the first actually, uh, Asian basketball players because he was quite, you know, it's rare for Asians to be so tall. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he was quite a bit taller, almost a foot taller than his mother. Um, and he was taller than both of his parents. And he didn't start life that way, actually. I asked him about this. So I was like, so excited when he signed up to the Lakers, because I was like, how did he do it? Um, and I asked him, so, you know, you know, you're taller than your parents. How did, do you have any idea how that came about? And I like, what did you eat? You know, sort of a leading question, but um, I asked, so I asked him and what he told me was, well, when I was in elementary school, I was shorter than everybody and I hated it. I hated being patted on the head and treated like, you know, a, you know, like a little toy. He, he, this is again, our real prejudice that nobody wants to talk about. Um, but so he said to his mom, what can I do to grow tall? I don't like being short. And she amazingly said, um, eat lots of protein, drink milk and take calcium supplements and he did and he's taller than anyone else in his family yeah i mean it's it it honestly becomes really really undeniable because ultimately beauty is basically just uh, you know it's like you said it's not necessarily like it's not a prejudice in the bad sense of the word but it's a prejudice in the sense of we are we are choosing health when it comes to mating like have you, have you ever heard the um phrase or heard of the uh the sexy son hypothesis no. It's it sounds crazy. It sounds super like ridiculous, but it's essentially a mother chooses a mate in the hopes of having an attractive son because the son can then continue the bloodline, right? That's that's one of the, it's like early 1900s, super wild, but uh, okay. it, it seems yeah. like one of those every single one of these things that gets negatively impacted or or that is apparent. So like uh, the maxillary and mandibular arch obviously fits your teeth better, the shape and size of your nose for breathing more effectively, the plumpness of your lips, uh, your hips for childbirth, broad shoulders on a on a man. And, and, and what's even crazier is we, we try to act like these things don't have some kind of evolutionary or attractive benefit, but then we found right. a way to turn all of these into a surgical solution. Like- yeah. It's, it's just, it's crazy to me, but something, so I'm, I'm 30 and something that I've started noticing as more and more and more of my friends are starting to have kids, more than half of the moms I know have had to have a C-section. What can you tell us about that? Well, that that's tied to, uh, the sexy son of hypothesis and the sexy mom hypothesis, if, <laughs> if there were one, um, which I'm shocked that you need a hypothesis for that, because I think yeah. it's kind of common sense. I mean, you go to any gene bank, right. And the, the sperm banks, I mean, and the women are like, well, I want a tall man who's got a, been to a good college. And I, I don't know, I don't think they can show faces, but, um, yeah. you know, that's the best surrogate is height. Uh, yeah. so it, it's, it's silly that we even say it's like theoretical, um, but uh, yeah. So the question was, um, hmm, C-sections. 
<laughs> C-sections. Yes. That has to do with hip width. So your hips have to be a certain width in order to bear children without a cesarean section. And a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of press about like how many cesarean section births there are and depending on what study you look at and in what country it might range from a low of 15% to a high of more than 30%. And a lot of these, you know, because it varies so much in countries and, and it tends to be higher in wealthier countries, they just say, oh, well, it's, you know, because it's convenient for everyone. It's like a, uh, a shortcut. But when I, so I'm a family medicine doctor, we deliver babies. And I, I know that there were a few scheduled cesarean sections, but they were scheduled for what we call VBACs, which means vaginal or, or you know, they, birth after c-section like you don't want to have a v-back you wanted necessarily because if you were a v-back vaginal birth after cesarean you had a greater chance of complications at least that was the thinking of the day right. it's evolved a little bit it's evolved a little bit like serious complications like uterine rupture right that means like basically death okay almost. yeah high yeah it's a high mortality when that happens so they didn't want to take the chance and um and and so it was done for a reason Sometimes it was, and of course, when it was done for a reason, it wasn't scheduled in the middle of the night. It was scheduled when it was convenient for everyone. So the media just takes that and runs with that. Like, oh, these are convenient cesarean sections. And it's that's why it's higher in um, wealthier countries. Well, the, the wealthier countries, we're wealthy when it comes to technology and stuff like that. But we are less wealthy when it comes to nutrition in a lot of ways, or at least we were 20, 30 years ago, because the, the folks who we call demeaningly subsistence farmers who grow their own food um, are very connected to nature and much tend to be um, getting better nutrition on average, right? It was a shocking to say, but they are because they're not for number one, they're not getting vegetable oils and they're not getting tons of sugar either. They might be getting a lot of rice or a lot of kind of empty calories ish sort of things and maybe not quite enough meat, but the, in general, um, that is something that humanity has dealt with in the past. And, you know, we have dealt with times of shortages, but we haven't dealt with this toxicity. So when we have this toxicity, a variety of skeletal changes occur and one of them is just the narrowed pelvis and that narrowed pelvis means that the head can't get through and there's a term for it's taking too long to deliver your baby uh, that's called failure to progress and um, this is in the early first or second stage of labor when the cervix is supposed to be dilating at a certain rate and the head of the baby is supposed to be descending down and if too much time passes um, that's a stress on the baby, it can be a stress on the mom. And after a certain amount of time, um, the, you start to see indications that, of fetal distress show up on the baby's heart rate monitor. And this is why most cesarean sections are done. And that fetal distress doesn't just occur because of pelvic narrowing. It also occurs because of inflammatory diets and inflammation. So there's a lot of reasons why we're having these very high cesarean section rates. But cesarean section rates being that high is not acceptable it's not something that i mean i don't i don't mean to like say you shouldn't have a cesarean section no not at all no if, if you I'm need thinking. it you need it but it's like why right. is this so frequent when this yeah. didn't used to be as a society we're just like oh you know well now we have a high cesarean section rate but if doctors were on their game if they knew about these changes in body morphology um they would be saying wait a second here this is a major like evolutionary problem. If suddenly we don't have electricity, uh, how are we going to have babies giving birth, right? And this is mm -hmm. going to become more of a problem as, you know, our grid get old, gets older and we have more and more extreme weather and stuff like this. And the hospitals just run out of backup power and more, you know, of course, it's not going to be the developed countries first, but it's going to become more of a problem. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, maybe people will do something about it. And, but, I, you know, they have to understand the underlying uh, issue coming from nutrition transgenerationally. It's not something that's going to be easy to fix in, in a given generation, uh, but it is something that we need to be paying attention to and talking about. How are we going to fix it? How are we going to get enough nutrition to everybody? We can't just pretend these seed oils are healthy when all the people evidence are sure trying yeah oh well they have it's the people who are trying are 
are financially entangled with the industry in one did way you, or shape or form. Did you see the thing that just got dropped recently? This is like with, within the last week, like the Washington Post did this like huge thing covering like dozens of major nutritionists and dietitians all over TikTok. And it basically came out that they were getting just tons and tons of money thrown at them to be like, yeah, aspartame, artificial sweeteners, these things, totally fine, totally fine, totally fine. And it was just like, that there was, it made me laugh because there's one person I got into an argument with Twitter years ago who was actually in the list. And I was like, I got you. I got you. <laughs> oh, so it was about the people on TikTok. It wasn't just about like, you know, the Harvards and the Tufts and the Yales. Oh, it was about it's, it'll, it'll, I'm sure it's going to get there eventually. Like it's, it's kind of, you know, undeniable. It's, it, 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 yeah. it does become this like systemic thing because it seems like there's, there's no incentivization to to actually fix this. So like, I think you talk about this um, in Deep Nutrition with uh, Pottinger's cats, or maybe maybe you reference um, it, but it's like, right now we're kind of at that generation where, you know, the cats breed, the cats keep on eating this low quality diet and they get a little worse and then they breed again. And then it gets to the point where they're just completely feral and degenerate. And it's like, we're, we're at that third generation now of processed foods. And right now we have a quote solution in that we can just do these C-sections, but what happens when they're just, you know, when we go from not being able to, you know, have a successful birth to just being completely infertile. And it feels like we're getting closer and closer to that. We are. I mean, we have lower sperm counts than ever. We have, um, you know, teenagers with the libido of 50 and 60 year olds. And by the way, libido in your 50s and 60s as a man, it doesn't, is not supposed to decline. Like there's no evolutionary reason for that. And it, it does now for reasons that have to do with the vegetable oils and the, their cholesterol lowering effects and our war on cholesterol, basically, which is a war on, you know, sex hormones, it's both a war on male real and food. Female. Yeah. Um, so the, um, I mean, I was just talking to a high school senior yesterday who was saying, who is into actually real food. She follows me. And, um, you know, she was saying that one of her friends, many of her friends, they actually just grew up on processed foods, you know, including the, the seed oils, the vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they don't even, their parents don't even know how to cook. So we've just become so disconnected from the things that make us healthy that it's really, you know, we're in a ticking time bomb here as to what's going to happen with our health. And I think we're already seeing it, unfortunately. Like, so when I first wrote the original version of Deep Nutrition, that was, I wrote, the original version of Deep Nutrition came out in 2009, early 2009. And I was writing it starting in 2002. It was a long and horrible process. I mean, it was fun, but it was horribly long. <laughs> yeah, I like I, I write out my scripts for solo podcasts. I can't imagine writing a you know four or five hundred page book. Yeah, it was difficult. So um, plus, I kept like finding new things that I was like, oh my gosh, this kind of changes everything I was thinking. So I had to rewrite yeah. a lot. So one of the things, though, that uh, the reason I'm bringing this up because you brought up uh, what's happening, you know, with that third generation. Well, I was writing this a generation ago, <laughs> and uh, you know, I predicted in that book uh, that I said something along the lines of. At that time, we were talking about bracing for the aging baby boomers and like how that was going to be a big hit on our finances, you know, Medicare and the hospital system. And we were going to be paying so much for people over 65. We weren't going to have anything left for everyone else because of these like um, congressional entitlements that you can't really to know Congress is going to take them away, um, even if you kind of should for the greater good. Uh, again, another, you know, third rail, not allowed to talk. Oh about yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a question about that too, but, but sorry, continue. Uh, so, we'll get there. So in the book, I, I, we said, my husband and I wrote it, um, that like this, this is on our minds, this, you know, but increased medical costs for aging, but given what, given the whole picture, given the implications of epigenetics and everything we talked about we need to be thinking about how our children are going to be straining the medical system because they're going to be medication dependent. And unfortunately, tragically, I mean, obviously nobody listened, right? 
because uh, if they did, maybe I'd be Surgeon General or something. I don't know. <laughs> you have to be, right? I mean, you would have to be in this kind of position of authority to really make it the kind of changes that we need. Um, but yes, um, <clears throat> yes, it's laughable. I'm sorry. But uh, but I still, <laughs> I think it might help. Um, so yeah, but like since that didn't happen, now we have we do have medication dependent youth. Look at what's going on with ADD and the Ritalin shortage and how people are are struggling and suffering without this medication. They need it, right? It's not just performance enhancing. It's it's life enabling. They they need it to function. And so, you know, this is what you would expect unfortunately. It's, I mean, it's almost like a massive, uh, why didn't you listen? I told you so kind of thing, but it's right there. It's the truth and it's going to get worse. Like that's the big point here is that this is urgent. It's not just a matter. I mean, it is a matter of your own personal health and that's where you can start, of course. And that's the most important place to start. But if, if you want to be a functional society in 20, 20 years, we need to be talking about this now on a broad level because it's affecting us as a society already. And it's going to continue to affect us. It's just, I can't say math because biology isn't quite math, but it's as close to the It's math. a nearly undeniable pattern at this point. Yes, it's... And an, almost an inevitability. And we certainly need to do something about it in order for our health to turn around. So with, with seed oils kind of being as, as contested as they are, and to be, to be clear, I'm like 99% in favor of avoiding them. And that 1% I can't really answer for because I don't know why. Uh, you, you were one of the very first people that I ever actually heard push back on them. Um, are, are you familiar with the phrase steel man, like the opposite of creating a straw man argument? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. So yep. I'd be, I'd be very curious cause you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that say there's like no such thing as a bad food. There's just intolerances and allergies. Right. Um, and yep. they try to make the argument like, Hey, this isn't seed oils. This isn't processed sugar. This isn't this, uh, it's, it's just too many calories and they'll uh -huh. usually cite something like the Twinkie diet or the McDonald's diet and say, see, look, all these people did was cut calories, get adequate protein. Granted, they were doing like protein shakes. Um, are, are you are you familiar with those? And I guess what's, yep. what's kind of your take on that? Yeah. So just to give you the background, so there was no talk about seed oils until I started the conversation. Um, so th th let's just, you know, get that out there. Oh, so yeah, my book came out in 2009. Nobody was talking about it. The closest that we came shortly after that was um, some of the paleo books um, and Lauren Cordain, who had brought up this issue of the imbalance between omega-3 and omega-6. But that that's not the issue. The issue with seed oils, and this is why it's important to understand where it came from, because with any scientific theory, you need to know its origin to know what the real story is, what the real theory is. This is not about an imbalance at all. This is about something called oxidative stress. So these seed oils promote oxidative stress, and the oxidative stress changes our metabolism in a way that drives us to need sugar, since we can't burn our own body fat for energy. This is the subject of another book that maybe you've read is um, The Fat Burn Fix. Fat Burn Fix, yeah. Yeah, so I talk about we need to fix our fat burning capacity because we aren't right now burning our own body fat for fuel. And that's why we overeat, right? So it is true. Overeating is definitely a problem. But it's a manifestation of the underlying oxidative stress that's ah, caused by metabolism. I see. Okay. Seed oils. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so as a kind of a little bit of a shift, uh, what can you tell us about the diet that you were actually doing with the Lakers as, as the nutrition director? Well, it was a, a completely ancestral diet, completely based on all the principles of, of deep nutrition and the fat burn fix because they're the same. And, uh, so the first and foremost thing that we did, which, uh, was not at all easy was to get the seed oils out of their diet every single place that the Lakers fed them, which was at the training facility, it was uh, on the airplanes, it was at the hotels before games, and 
during the games at the stadium so that they didn't have to eat the nacho <laughs> cheese, you know, and the hot dogs and the French fries there. Uh, so the stadium food is some of the worst of the worst. So uh, that was a big, 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 big part of it. And also like kind of, so that was like reducing the inflammation. I, I, we spoke, uh, I spoke a lot about the problem with relying on sugar for fuel, which is what they had all heard their entire careers, their entire lives, because the sports nutritionists, unfortunately, are some of the, the um, worst in terms of the, cor the corruption, you know, with uh, Gatorade, obviously, uh, having a vested interest in promoting Gatorade, which is loaded with sugar, and fueling with sugar during the game, which is absolutely one of the worst things you can do for your body's access to your own body fat for energy and, you know, the ultimate production of ketones and stuff like this. So, um, so that was another aspect of it, but the funnest aspect was really helping some of them who are really interested in it become more foodies, more foodie oriented. Like Kobe was already into food. The stuff but, he wrote um, about Kobe was so cool to me. Like just the, the fact that he was like, like essentially started like buying a specific meal prep or something. Cause he was just like, everything feels better. Like that's awesome. Yeah. So like the, um, the, yes, he did get his meals delivered by somebody who could, you know, make food the way that I suggested that I wanted, like he had multiple chefs actually that he went through. Uh, I don't know why, but, um, I think it's just something like with the household or, or something, there was a lot of turnover, but, uh, <laughs> all, every single one of those chefs, uh, had long conversations with me about the oils and what to do instead of sugar and, you know, what to do for snacks. Since that was a big issue with sports, they're always wanting their snacks and <clears throat> snacking uh, is, is not really good for your fat burn either. So I was always like, that was a big tug of war with everyone except for, except for like Steve Nash and a couple of folks who, are, who uh, like were really like into the whole newness of uh, burning body fat and ketones and stuff like that. Cause you know, this was 2011 and nobody was talking about the keto diet then either. Um, so, so yeah, it was a fun adventure and I learned, uh, I learned a lot about athletes and just how sadly miseducated they are and how many people are, always trying them to tell, I'm sorry, and many people are always trying to control what they eat, right, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was just quite the eye-opening experience, but I met a lot of wonderful people and it was great. So it's, are you, are you saying you don't like using, for, for athletes, you don't like carbohydrates as a source at all or just not sugar? Well, it's about the timing and yes, and sugar specifically, um, because sugar is like the opposite thing you want when you're trying to burn your body fat because it releases insulin and insulin um, makes your body fat stay in your body fat, right? It's, the, it's like locks the door to the fat closet. You want to mobilize that fat into your bloodstream when you're an athlete, you know, because you need it for energy. It's the best source of energy. But if you just lock that door shut now you need more sugar and you need more gatorade so it's really good You're for trying to remove access to that uh remove access to that like massive fuel source yeah yeah exactly and of course you know other soft drink industries support the um the the whole um sports right they're they're sponsors right so it's very important for dietitians to be favorable think favorably about sugar but they are essentially a marketing arm for big food, really, because it's big food who is doing the air quotes studies, which are paper studies, but the outcome of those studies is predetermined. So when you have people preaching about evidence-based this, evidence-based that, what- Who's paying? Who's paying? Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, there's a lot of things you could call evidence, but- it's about the quality of the evidence. And these days you have to be smart and ask that question because to fail to ask that question is to fail to think like a scientist. I mean, it's not a matter of conspiracy. It's a matter of failing to consider the environment you're living in, which is a business oriented, you know, money talks environment. Simple as that. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, absolutely. Like my my very first fitness job, I, I remember working at a gym and they go, hey, you can make this much extra money by selling these supplements. And, you know, I, I do the math on my hourly wage and then, you know, do the math on the bonus. And I'm like, oh my God, I can make so much more money selling this. And I, I remember literally standing in front of the supplement case, selling it to somebody and they go, well, what do you think about it? And I'm like, oh God, I've never used this shit. Like just <laughs> like, just, and it was like such an ethical, like crazy moment for me. Cause I was like, oh my God, I'm selling something I've never used before. And like, when I started looking into it, it was like, oh, I haven't used it and I'm never going to like, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so when we, when we look at like, are, are you familiar with, um, I think it's Roger J. Williams book, biochemical individuality. I'm not familiar with that book. No, Ooh, I, th I think you'd really, really like it. it like it's, it gives credence to so much of what you talk about, but essentially just the, everybody is like so different. Like our bodies get built completely differently, but there are still these like core things that we all require. Um, but when we look at, when we look at that, we look at ancestral dieting, it, it seems plausible. Like the argument could be made that some people might do better on a plant-based diet. And this is something that I kind of discuss back and forth is, is there, is there a perfect diet, which I don't necessarily think there is. I think there are, uh, you know, probably a 90% thing that we all kind of have in common. And then it's that 10% that is just a matter of like you and where you come from. Um, but you know, we're all, we're all very different with centuries and centuries of evolution. It, it seems like it would make sense that maybe some people could adapt to a more like plant and carbohydrate heavy diet given modern day conveniences of global food travel, supplementation, do you think there is any argument to be made that some people could do better on a plant-based or vegan diet versus something like omnivorous and carnivore? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, we are somewhat r have run, you know, perhaps have run that experiment because we know that when people, uh, go to islands and, um, you know, resources are limited, except they're tropical islands. So there's more plants than animals. Um, and also we know from certain populations that have been isolated in different ways by being forced up mountains by civilization, they become more dependent on like potatoes. I'm thinking of the Tucanesians. Um, in particular, they're like 90% of their diet is Tucanesia. So they have adapted. They do adapt. We all would adapt. But the way that we adapt is by be just be shrinking, right? Because we're getting less nutrition, less protein particularly, and uh, certain vitamins, we're getting less of those. So they're shorter. So like that's why when you go to these places, you see that the researchers are like towering over them. And they're often like the men like will peak out at five feet. Um, so that's wow. the adaptation. Yeah. So it kind of becomes this like robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's like you, like you said at the b very beginning of this, the, the body's not stupid with its nutrients. It, it does what it absolutely needs to do with what it has available. And you know, if that means it's going to like sacrifice your height or your bone density to make it so yeah. that you can at least reproduce, it's going to, it's going to figure that out more or less. Absolutely. I mean, that is not even, I think if I were evolution talking right now, I would be saying, well, that's not, ba not a bad thing. Um, because yeah, it's, like, it's great. I like, given, given I like big creatures and I like small creatures, right? That's mm -hmm. evolution talking. Uh, you know, that there's that's what you have to do in order to survive. We, we need to be able to adapt. So we are adapting. We have adapted. We will adapt. And that is how, right? And so one of the things that I, th I, I think is uh, happening right now in terms of this adaptation is that people who are have very, you know, are tall, right? The the Danes and the people up in Scandinavia, they are tall, but now they're changing their diet too in a less lower protein way, particularly less dairy because it's had so. Oh, oh, are you still oh yeah, no, I'm just, I'm like, I, like that. You, you just kind of like had me have like a, because one of my friends is a one of my friends is a chef uh, up in Northern Europe, and he he posts all of his like you know stuff that he cooks and. I mean, five, five, six years ago when he and I met, it was just meat, 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 meat. And like everything he's doing now is like these tiny little two, three ounce portions of meat now and like massive plates of like, you know, starchy carbs and stuff. And I was just like thinking about it like a couple months ago. I was like, what the, like, what happened here? Right. So the next generations are going to be probably shorter and the current generations may have more osteoporosis or, uh, you know, bone thinning or osteoarthritis, which is degeneration of the bones when they're not strong enough to support 
certain points, the pressure points in the, within the joint. And this has happened also, like I just, you know, ran into an example the other day. I was watching a 1972 series called uh, Vanishing World on YouTube. It's, it's fascinating. And they went to uh, somewhere in Sudan and it was a population of um, Africans who were similar to the Maasai. They weren't the Maasai. I, I forget the name exactly, but they were dairying, right? They, they, they mostly ate um, uh, milk and the blood of the cattle and occasionally would eat the meat and just supplemented occasionally with vegetables. And they were so tall. It was like they I looked like I, I felt like I was watching a distorted um you know, footage because they were so <laughs> You're like, Their this just doesn't track mentally. Small. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I looked it up and their average height in, when they were measured at two time points, one time point was 1950s. Um, and the average height of men and women was six feet. Okay. Men and women. Oh my God. And now get this. When they went back in the 1990s after years of famine and eating famine food, you know, like rice and uh, f stuff that can be flown in, lots of sugar for their tea, which a lot of them sadly subsisted off of, way less protein. Average height now reduced by four inches to 5'8". Oh, wow. So this is how we adapt. And, and that, is a, that is thanks to evolution because the other option is to die. Right. Yep. So we get shorter. So that's an adaptation. All animals, we've, we've been through this in our history many, many times, right? Between our origins and wherever they were. Some people say it's Africa. Some people say maybe not, <laughs> you know, because only the latest thing was out of Africa. But mm. people have gotten tall and short. Like, this is a known thing among people who uh, study human bones. Like they know that when we adopt farming, our bones change and we become a little bit shorter. It's well established. Um, and by the way, if any, if you are into history at all, oh, um, I'm all over it. Do you know the Yamnaya? Then the, have, give have me the name that? one more time. Yamnaya. So the I Yamnaya, they're somewhat notorious um, because they, many, many people in Europe are descended from the men only um, because this was a group that uh, it's just so fascinating. So this has a lot to do back with dairy um, and dairy just having this amazing ability to make people tall for, you know, for mysterious reasons. Not so mysterious, right? Calcium, all the bone growing stuff. But uh, so this, uh, the Yamnaya were uh, people of the steppe in Eurasia. So the steppe in Eurasia is kind of like where we think of Mongolia, but Mongolia all the way east to the Mediterranean and kind of even beyond that. Um, and it's a high plateau of grasslands. And so this was around, starting around 70,000 years ago, um, after farming had already been established, people went back from farming to herding and they herded the somewhat domesticated animals that the farmers had, you know, maybe the farmers domesticated animals first, they're still sorting all that out, but they went full on with herding and became mobile, uh, but, but used domesticated animals and their main food was dairy and uh, the blood of the animals uh, in some cases and the meat. The, you know, things that they would hunt, they would hunt maybe on horseback, but they were very successful hunters. They were also notoriously successful raiders. And, you know, they were a warrior society and they did not very nice things to the towns that they uh, came across, which was most of Europe and is why many, um, most of Europe now has some Yamnaya ancestry, even though they would just started out in this little population somewhere, maybe around um, Ukraine, somewhere like that. They, are they just kept getting out. stronger and healthier and traveling, I guess. Yeah. And they were Oof. bigger. They were physically bigger. So it was easier for them to be this warrior class and they had horses, right? So they just seemed like they could move fast and, you know, they, they were aggressive and they were strong and tall and you know muscular we think and you know this is based on archaeology and anthropology and 
anthropology says because of their physique, they spread their genetic plume in the form of the mostly Y chromosome. You have to trace mm. Y chromosomes for this to see this. And you can see that the, the Y chromosome of the Yamnaya ended up in like something like 90% of people of European ancestry and possibly even a good portion of people of Indian ancestry because it was Indo-European, right? We all share this similar language um, and similar culture in a way. And uh, like you can go to India and there's worshiping cows, right? This, it was all about the bovine and the the mammals and their, their, their milk. <laughs> yep, yep, so... Yep. Yeah, it's like you would think, you know, drinking milk is for babies. Well, actually, drinking milk is for badasses, too, because these were arguably the baddest badasses in all of human history. Yeah, dude, I was like my mom. God, God bless her. Uh, my, my mom would like always catch me like drinking milk out of the cart when I was a little kid because my my dad was a semi-competitive powerlifter and bodybuilder when I was younger. And uh, like I would just always see him drinking milk and stuff like that. So like before... And, and it's funny because I, I ended up like not being a fitness person at all until I graduated high school, but I would always like chug milk out of the, out of the gallon, you know, cause you hear like, it's going to make you big and strong. Um, I, I did have one specific question about fat burn fix. Cause pr pretty much everything we've talked about is like, uh, kind of out of deep nutrition, but you had this one quote in it that I, I really, really loved. Cause it, it actually made me think about when I was younger you said hunger is supposed to be a high energy state, not a low energy state. There's so many people out there that they'll go, oh God, I'm so exhausted. I just need a snack or I need to this or I need to that. When I was younger, I was really, really skinny. I am 6'3 and I was 140 pounds and I would just play video games for hours and hours and hours with no food. Like I'm talking 10 plus hours at a time. And like my mom would always just be like, I don't, I don't know how you're doing it it's there's there's obviously like a ton of factors that go into this but i i do want to hear you discuss that that concept of like hunger being a high energy state versus a low one so you weren't eating right like a lot of people think of people with video games like they're sitting down they're not munching on stuff but you were not yeah i was just i i was just fully locked i i got diagnosed with adhd when i was a kid and uh, <laughs> i'm kind of you know who didn't at this point but like i i don't take anything for it uh, cuz i just it doesn't really matter to me but like i I would just never be hungry and I would just be fully zoned in, focused on, on whatever it was that I was doing at that time. Yeah, so that is the way it's supposed to be because as we get farther away in time from our meal, our last meal, our insulin level drops and that insulin level dropping enables um, uh, hormones. Our hormones control, you know, what fuel we are using in a lot of ways. And so the hormone that controls whether you're burning body fat the most these days is insulin. And so as you get farther away from the last meal, your insulin level goes farther and farther, and that enables the fat in your, your body fat um, to get into the bloodstream where then the liver can convert it into ketones. And that requires another hormone called glucagon. And usually if you've not been eating and particularly if not been eating a ton of carbs, you have more glucagon. And glucagon being high and insulin being low really dramatically amps up the, the ketones. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that the ketones can also come from muscle. And that's one of the mm. you know reasons I think that a lot of people these days when we're burning, we're forcing our bodies to try to burn this body fat that, I don't know if your, if your diet had vegetable oil in it, but if it did, then your body fat had vegetable oil, polyunsaturated fatty acids in it, which are, which do not successfully produce cellular energy. So that's why people crave sugar, or in some cases, that's why they're super skinny, because instead of, you know, if you just don't have glucose in, stored in your liver anymore, if you've been sitting down there playing you know, for hours and hours, maybe you ran out. Um, but if you did, you have a that you have a backup plan for that too, which is muscle. So muscle we can turn into oh, sugar, I had but we can none also of that. Trust me. <laughs> right. I mean, so it, you, a lot of people think, well, it's lack of exercise, and also maybe your protein was not so good in your diet. But also, it can very well be that you're breaking down your muscle 
in order to generate energy for your cells so that they don't have to burn so much of that body fat that is essentially toxic. And that is all what I uh, you know, talk about in the fat burn fix, because I think it's essential to not force your body to burn body fat that it doesn't want to burn. I, I've just seen that it has some long-term consequences, you know, like I, I just worry, you know, as a physician, first do no harm. The last thing I want to do is tell people, oh yeah, just, you know, don't eat, you'll lose weight or just, you know, cut all your carbs and you'll be fine. Well, your body's gonna, you still have that same polyunsaturated body fat that your body didn't want to burn in the first place that made you overeat and gain weight. And now your body's going to have to come up with some other plan. And some people, you know, don't feel bad from this for a very long time. And then they get things like kidney stones or gout or kidney failure. And I just have to say that I can't be sure it's not from forcing their body to metabolize protein differently in this unhealthy way that harms their body. Because when your body doesn't want to burn that body fat, because the burning the body fat will cause oxidative stress, oxidative stress is incompatible with cellular health. And your cells can, can control what fuel they're getting, and they can demand more sugar. And this is what makes some people you know, extraordinarily hungry and, you know, crave sugar. And some people not because perhaps like you, um, you know, you're zoned in there and you are successfully creating ketones. So your brain just feels fantastic. You have plenty of energy, but where do those ketones come from? And, mm -hmm. you know, there right, could right. be some cost, right? So uh, I like to be very cautious and I don't recommend it's not that I re don't recommend a keto diet. I, I recommend that you assess your ability to burn your body fat and your metabolic health before you go full on keto, right? And ease into it if, if you're going to go keto. Don't just cut out those carbs gradually. And, and, and you want to think about and strategically build meals that help sustain your energy so you don't get hungry and need snacks. And that's what the Fat Burn Fix is all about. And you know, I've gotten, it's been out for a while now, thousands and thousands of people have read it. And I've gotten so many letters where people just say, I tried everything. I tried fasting. I tried keto. I tried vegan. I tried literally everything. And this worked when nothing else did. And I think that's just because it's designed for our metabolism, our modern metabolism, which is different, right? We're not, you know, never before in history have we had unsaturated fatty acids in our body fat. Never before in history have we had body fat that our, our cells don't want to burn. That is a completely novel and unhealthy metabolic state. And we're adapting to it. Yes, but we will, but our adaptation, you can't, you can only adapt so far. And so, you know, you can shrink up, you can become insulin resistant. That is an adaptation to this. Um, the alternative is dying, right? Yeah. So that's the adaptation. The adaptation is disease. And yep. I don't see that becoming something, you know, like in five, six generations, suddenly people are going to be able to subsist on vegetable oils and mm -hmm. sugars. I just don't see that. I think that we'll be gone from the planet <laughs> if that's going to our diet. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, it, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I don't suppose you got a few more minutes. Oh gosh, it's already 12. Um, yeah, no, I have a few more minutes. Yep. Okay. Okay. I, <laughs> I, 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 I have like two more pages. Um, but we'll, uh, let, I'll, uh, I'll throw a few at you. Um, what, what has been your opinion on the carnivore diet? Yeah, so it's great to get people started. I don't know that I would recommend it for super long unless somebody's going full on deep nutrition with it, right? Because right. so deep nutrition, um, I lay out four kind of strategies that every culture the around four the pillars. World, yes, the four pillars of world cuisine or also you know, called the four pillars of a human diet because people everywhere did these things. So you can get fresh food, you know, you can eat, you know, raw stuff <laughs> and people have, um, and you can get, so raw, like fresh food just means uncooked. You can get fermented, uh, foods on, on a carnivore diet, uh, you know, in theory, 
uh, I can't think of any made with meat, but it, a lot of people on carnivore include dairy and they'll include yogurt, which is fermented. Um, and then the other pillar is uh, meat on the bone. And of course you can get Easy. bone broth when you're following carnivore. And then the final one is organ meats. And I really think that if you are wanting to do carnivore long-term, you definitely need to include some of these exotic things, like not just liver, but bone marrow and um, other parts, uh, other interesting and edible organs. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying to, trying to slowly, uh, get my girlfriend to eat some more organ meat and she's very resistant to it, but, uh, hopefully she hears this and she's like, okay, fine. Um, so these are a couple, um, listener questions. One of these is kind of funny. It can probably just be a quick one. Do you believe in aliens? Um, well, I believe there could be aliens, but I don't think they, they have bothered to visit earth and not bothered okay. to make it known. All right. <laughs> Um, what's, what's been your opinion on semaglutide? Oh, it's yeah. When it first came out, um, I started using it for my patients with diabetes and it worked like very well. It's a fantastic diabetes drug. If you're going to use a drug, um, which, uh, you know, some people really do need a little extra help. It, it, I think it helps people a lot because it helps suppress their overactive appetite. Now, at the same time, you have to change your diet because again, you'll just be burning that unhealthy body fat. And I think that's why that this drug is associated with thyroid cancer and pancreatic you know, failure and so many side effects because you're forcing your cells to burn this body fat that it doesn't want to burn. And the reason you became overweight was in defense of all that. Absolutely. Yeah. It kind of seems like one of those things that might be good for getting people to kind of begin on the right path, but it's, right. it can't be something you just rely upon forever. Um, there was a, a question asked by someone about the concept of like the ends justify the means. Uh, the, the way that they presented it is this recent thing with the Washington Post finding people getting paid, dietitians getting paid by uh, food companies. Um, and then they actually brought up Liver King. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he, you know, got caught oh, in this yeah, massive, yeah, this like massive scandal about uh, oh. lying about all kinds yeah. of stuff. What's what's oh. been your opinion on people maybe misleading people to an extent, but you know, in in the end, in the long term, hopefully this yields a a positive effect. Do you think it's okay to have kind of an ends justify the means mentality, or do you think it's it's like, hey, you know what, you just got to be blunt with people if they don't agree or if they don't want to listen, then it is what it is. Like, where where do you kind of stand on that? I think you, there is something to be said for the ends justify the means, but you have to have your end game in mind. You have to have the full plan, not just like, oh, I'm going to sell this supplement and make a lot of money. Um, and, you know, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, tell people what a healthy diet is, but I need to sell these supplements so that I can afford to do that. I think that's, you know, that's an okay end game, but it's uh, not the big picture. And I like to address the big picture and the big picture problem is that, um, you know, we don't have healthy food in our food supply. And I think any real, um, you know, ends needs to consider that, right? If we're talking about justifying an end, we need to consider that somehow in our business plan or our thinking about it and our mental justification for it. Okay. Uh, what is something you've changed your mind on just over the, you know, 20, 20 plus years, I believe you said, what, what's something you used to really, really strongly believe that, that you've changed your mind on recently? Well, I used to believe that sugar was about as bad as vegetable oil. And I'd say, well, when I wrote the fat burn fix, I wrote it because I came to the realization that vegetable oil drives us to become sugar addicts. And I lay that out in the fat burn fix. Um, and so then, you know, that was a big, that was a big one. For me, and I, and I think it's really important because there's still all this conversation focusing first on sugar and insulin when that is a byproduct of what vegetable oil does to our metabolism. Okay. Uh, who or so aside from your books, obviously, who or what are some sources you uh, you think are really really worth checking out? Like if people love love what you do, who are some other people that are worthwhile to check out? So Brian Sanders um, runs a podcast called uh, The Food Lies, I think. Oh, he's doing a video, a movie called Food Lies. I think his podcast might be called Sapien, um, like Homo Sapien. Right, right. And he's very much in the ancestral health space. Like anybody ancestral, I'm going to love them because that's just the way we need to eat. It's how it's, we got it's here. It's dealing with reality. And, 
dealing with what? Uh, I was just going to say like ancestral dieting is basically dealing with reality. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. Dealing with reality. Right. And, you know, there are folks who are willing to have these harder conversations about our skeletal structure and what's going on in the big picture. It, it's a big picture kind of thing. Um, final, final bit. And then, uh, you know, I know you've probably got tons of other stuff that, that you got to do. Uh, you kind of hinted you're working on some stuff. Uh, I know you can't tell me everything, but what do people have to look forward to from Dr. Kate Shanahan? Well, yes. Yeah, so I got the clearance now to go ahead and oh, um, cool. since, yeah, starting maybe by the time this drops, it'll be available for pre-order on Amazon. So my next book is going to be called Dark Calories, and it's focusing on vegetable oil and what it's done to our bodies, to our health, and how it's twisted and distorted medicine so that healthcare is dangerous. And, you know, it's a very dark thing that uh, we have to be aware of whenever we go and enter the medical system in need of some sort of help, particularly anything to do with heart health, because the medical system um, is now, you know, just designed to keep us sadly in dependence on the medical system. So we really need to understand a little bit about the mechanics of that. And I explain a few things that will help you not be, will help you be able to engage with the good aspects of the medical system and not get victimized by the predatory aspects. Right. It's, it seems like a, a, a lot of the people who are really making big strides in the, you know, nutrition, wellness, holistic health space are all kind of looking at like, hey, Western medicine has its place, but there are all these Eastern minded ideas around like using food to heal, using food as, as medicine. And it seems like that is kind of fi finally, you know, peeking through into uh, the public zeitgeist. Thank, thank God. Um, but Dr. Yeah, Kate, I, I could cool. seriously talk to you like for another hour. Uh, I, as soon as I got that email, I was like, oh my God, and just threw like tons of notes down about stuff I wanted to ask. So uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, is, there, is there anything I didn't ask you that you do want to say last minute or, uh, or anything like that? Oh, just, um, you know, please visit my website because I, I help people, you know, one-on-one -on -one and uh, I can help you work with any diet that you're already on. I can help you make it as healthy as possible. And, you know, we can get really granular with exactly what nutrients you might need and stuff like that. So, uh, and make sure that you're burning your body fat. That's always the end goal. <laughs> okay, perfect. And that is uh, drkate.com, correct? Yes. Okay. And if people want to follow your Instagram, where do they find you? So it's at D Dr. Kate Shanahan, D-R-C-A-T-E Shanahan on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, whatever okay. we call it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. X, <laughs> the company formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Well, Dr. Kate, thank you so much. Um, guys, make sure to check out uh, drkate.com, Dr. Kate. Shanahan on Instagram and uh, everywhere else. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys, my name is Andrew Holistic Motion. This is Dr. Kate Shanahan, and we will see you guys later. What a guest, huh, guys? Please go comment on their Instagram and let them know that you saw them here. And while you're just doing things that I ask you to, make sure to click this top video that I have linked. That is the last episode of the podcast, which I guarantee will add 10 pounds of muscle to your body. I'll see you there. Later. Later.